So you know that whenever we talk about events like this, I always like to shine um, a little light on some minority groups and how they all contribute in um, and towards this large goal that we're working for as a country. So here as we talk about World War II, I want to make sure that we're hitting on how um, several different minority groups were not just involved in the war, but affected by the war and what was going on at the same time. So we can start with our ladies. So there's a really common misconception that this was the first time women had gone to work was during World War II and all of you know that that's not true because we've been talking about women working much longer before this. We even talked about last semester women working um, and we talked about the lower girls during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and things like that. Um, but the reason why there's that conception is because it's the level of um, the amount of women working is much, much larger in World War II than it had ever been before. And then on top of that, the types of jobs um, that women are doing are different than the jobs they've been doing before. We're seeing a lot more women doing uh, non-traditional jobs, um, job, jobs that might be uh, you know, stereotypically thought of as a job that might be for a man, so more masculine jobs, things like uh, industrial workers or laborers or things like that. Like you see uh, these uh, two African-American women on the right in this photo, um, they're riveters. And so, you know, that famous uh, we can do it poster with Rosie the Riveter. Um, they are, that's what she's doing right here in this picture. She's riveting. So on to it looks like like the wing of a plane or something. So um, women are also going to stop quitting their jobs once they got married um, before it was really common for women to work up until they were married and then they would quit and stay at home and rely solely on the income of their um, husband. But that's really going to be on the decline during World War II. 75% um, of working women in war industries were actually married during World War II and 60% of them were over the age of 35. So we're going to be seeing some older women staying in their jobs as well. Um, women are going to be taking on blue collar and white collar jobs. The difference is blue collar is more like getting your hands dirty, um, more like physically intensive jobs, and a white collar job might be like a management position or a job in the service industry. Um, most were expected to step aside when men returned home from the war, um, except in the white collar jobs, but that isn't necessarily going to happen. Um, and then also during the war, the amount of women in secretarial or clerical positions is going to increase by five times. So obviously there's a lot of women, a lot of benefits to women working. There's a paycheck, new relationships, um, organizational experience, and it's really going to pave the way for years to come for women in the workplace. Uh, Long-term effects of women in the workplace um, at this level is going to be with, you know, daddy off in the war and mama at work. Babies are going to start to be staying in daycare a lot more often. Um, government spending is going to be put at about 50 million dollars on daycare for working moms during World War II. Um, now most children are still I'm sure many of you can relate. Um, like I know when I was little, like too little to go to pre-K, my mom had me like just stay with this nice old lady that she knew. Um, for some people, that might be a grandparent. It might be someone not related to you. Um, that's like a really popular thing, um, especially in the South. Um, and so that was something that was still happening during World War II. But we will see more women choosing to send their children to daycare. Um, African Americans are going to play a huge role in uh, World War II. Um, so we'll talk later on about their involvement in the war specifically. We'll talk about the Red Tails and, um, and the uh, different groups, different segregated units that are involved in World War II. But now we're going to mention um, civil rights and that movement during the war. Now, during World War One, remember the civil rights movement sort of got put on hold, um, and there wasn't really much progress because of that. But the women's movement wasn't put on hold during World War One. Remember Alice Paul and Carrie Chapman Cat, and because of that, they saw some traction. Right? They saw the 19th Amendment passed at the end of uh, the First World War. So here, um, the Civil rights movement leaders are going to try to take a page out of that book and not stop pushing for equality, regardless of whether or not we're in a time of war. So um, employment is still going to be disproportionately given to white Americans during during the war um, and jobs in the government and in the military are still going to be segregated. So the um, 
main uh, civil rights leader during this era is going to be this guy, A. Philip Randolph, and he's going to help to launch a campaign called uh, the Double V Campaign, uh, and that's the civil rights campaign during World War II. It stands for Victory Abroad Over Fascism and Victory at Home Over Discrimination and Racism. Um, so A. Philip Randolph didn't want to accept second-class citizenship, so he put a lot of pressure on FDR to end discriminatory practices in government training, employment, and in the armed services. He even started to plan a march on Washington. So finally, with even more push from Eleanor Roosevelt, um, FDR decided to make a move. So he is going to issue Executive Order Number 8802. Um, and basically what this does is it assures fair hiring practices in any job funded with government money. So not just uh, businesses that receive a government subsidy, but even businesses that have the government as a customer. Um, so like Ford, who is selling um, like planes and tanks and stuff to the armed forces, uh, they would be subject to this executive order. Uh, but we already talked about how Ford paid his his employees equally and things like that, but that's just an example. Uh, EO 8802 also establishes the Fair Employment Practices Committee to help enforce all of those uh, fair hiring policies and things like that. So with all of this, trying to incorporate the war into the civil rights movement in the 1940s is going to be very successful. And membership in civil rights organizations is going to grow a whole lot. The NAACP is going to see a lot more involvement. Um, at this time, we're going to see a new um, organization formed in 1942 called CORE. C-O-R-E. It stands for the Congress of Racial Equality. Um, and they're basically all about like nonviolent protests and things like that. CORE and the NAACP are going to be two of the main four civil rights organizations that we'll talk about in Unit 5 when we uh, cover the civil rights movement of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, so we definitely need to make sure that we mention uh, Native Americans and their involvement in the war. Um, there, I told you before there are over 25,000 Native Americans who serve in the armed forces uh, during World War II, but the most famous, uh, I guess, contribution that Native Americans as a whole make uh, in World War II are going to be the Navajo uh, Nation and their, I guess you would say, like partnership with the U.S. government to form the Navajo Code Talkers who would encode um, encrypted messages. So we have an advantage um, in the United States with our Native American populations in terms of we, they are unique to the United States. We're a country of immigrants and the only um, like cultures and languages spoken in the United States that are, aren't spoken anywhere else are our Native American languages. So um, we actually used the language and the people of the Navajo tribe to um, encrypt a lot of our military messages that we were sending. So if they were um, like intercepted or anything, then it would be much harder to ink to decrypt them and, and to figure out what uh, our message said. So that was a huge part of the war. Um, but like I said, we've got men and women from every tribe um, participating in World War II right here. This is a Navajo code talker right here. He's like talking over a radio to another Navajo code talker in their native language. Um, uh, passing military orders. We've got a group of Native Americans right here. Each of these men right here with Douglas MacArthur here in the middle, um, but each of these five men are actually representing different Native American tribes. So you can see like how diverse even among the Native American population our military was. Uh, right here is a Cherokee man who's involved in the um, attacks on Japan after uh, the Philippines and Pearl Harbor, who had, has this like stolen Japanese flag here um, when he was involved in those raids, which is pretty cool. So um, we are going to see even Native American women getting involved in the WACs and different organizations, and so Native Americans are going to play a big role. Uh, Mexican Americans are going to, uh, I guess the right words would be to say is very much impacted and affected by the war, um, not necessarily as much the other way around. Now, at home, our like whole thing is production, right? We're trying to make sure that we can keep up production levels, that production miracle. And that couldn't happen without the involvement of Mexican Americans in the United States because labor is going to be such an important thing, especially in agriculture. Um, now, with migration patterns shifting and people searching for work in cities, this is going to leave a lot of uh, the Southwest and the Southeast without as many people to work in the agricultural field. Now, if you remember during World or during the Great Depression, we actually were trying to send Mexican 
Americans back to Mexico through that repatriation because we had so few jobs here in the United States. It's going to be the total opposite during World War II. We're actually going to start a program called the Bracero Program, which brought laborers from Mexico to work on American farms. So we literally went to Mexico to recruit people to come to America to work because we needed workers so bad. During the war, hundreds of thousands of people were part of this program. Um, and it's really going to initiate a lot more migration from Mexico to the United States that's going to be happening over the next really like 100 years. Um, as migration patterns change, racial tensions change as well. Now, so I don't want you to think that um, this Bracero program was sort of this like... Um, I guess you say like utopia, like wonderful experience, like come to America and you're going to have a fam fabulous job and your family will be treated well and you'll be paid well and blah, 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 blah. It was not like that. Um, a lot of these Bracero uh, laborers were treated really horribly by the uh, farmers that they worked for. And, but there wasn't really a lot of options. It was either just like suck it up and deal with the bad treatment or go back to Mexico where the situation was like a no job. Uh, so it was not a, a great program in terms of treatment of employees, but it's going to be very important in terms of keeping our country on track to win the war. So as more people are moving to those cities, like I said, places like Chicago, Detroit, Gary, Indiana, um, even places out uh, further west like Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, Oakland, we're seeing more racial tensions in those cities as well. Um, in Detroit, for example, there was a riot um, of like, it started off as like a hundred thousand people in a park fighting and then the next day it was like full-scale riots and 34 people ended up being killed and we had to send in federal troops to sort of break things up and how crazy is that we're supposed to be fighting a war all of our troops and our military industries and resources should be going into fighting the enemy we're having to like break up tensions and problems at home because of racism it's really insane um Similar situations in Los Angeles, uh, Mexican Americans and young adults often wore this outfit called the Zoot Suit. Here's a Zoot Suit written right here. So Zoot Suit was basically like a really oversized, like sometimes pinstriped suit. Um, and they were called Zooters, the people who wore these outfits. And in June of 1943, some mobs of sailors that had been docked um, near Los Angeles went through Los LA, just like attacking all of these like Zooters and stuff. And when the fighting finally stopped and the police came out to arrest people they ended up arresting the victim they arrested the zooters not the sailors so we're still seeing a lot of that um, institutional racism as well not just um, things like embedded in the our culture and in the society Definitely the group, the minority group most impacted by the war, though, is going to be Japanese Americans. So after uh, Pearl Harbor, all enemy aliens, so any immigrant from an enemy country, was required to register with the government, get fingerprinted, and list any organizations that they were affiliated with. Um, 11,000 Germans and hundreds of Italians are going to be held in camps where they were monitored. Other people had curfews and travel restrictions. Um, they had to leave the West Coast temporarily in the winter of 19. 1942. Um, and once things calmed down a little bit, we took Germans and Italians off the list, but Japanese people were never taken off the list um, because our fight with Japan was a lot more personal and there was a lot more uh, like hate and racism. Uh, targeting Japanese Americans than Germans or Italians because of Pearl Harbor and what was going on in the Philippines. So in February of 1942, uh, FDR issued Executive Order 9066, which designated certain areas as war zones. So any person could be removed from a war zone for any reason. There were a lot of war zones on the West Coast because that's where we were the most vulnerable to Japan. So in September, the government had evacuated over 100,000 Japanese Americans from the West Coast. They were forced to sell their property at a lot and they were only allowed to take their uh, necessary items. So uh, when they were moving out of California, a lot of them were settling in the states just east of it, places like Arizona and stuff. And the governor of Arizona didn't want his state to become a quote unquote dumping ground for all of these Japanese people. He said so he put pressure on the government to do something else. And they decided that temporary imprisonment would be the easiest thing to do. So they're going to set up 
uh, internment camps. Here's a map of internment camps. I don't want you to think these are concentration camps. They're very, very different, um, but they are definitely like prison style camps. Um, a lot of them on Indian reservations and places like that. So a lot of these people were forced to stay um, in these camps up until the end of the war. Families were would stay in like one room shack. Single people would be in like bunks. There were food shortages and poor health care. It was a really, really um, horrible time in our nation's history. Um, it was even held up by the Supreme Court case Cormat v. the United States in 1944. The Supreme Court said that it was a legal decision to make, but finally in 1988 we agree to um, that it was wrong and we cut a $20,000 reparations payment to any of the survivors who were still living.